Let me begin the ISSM 2022 keynote speech session. With this, please allow me to introduce our honorable speaker today briefly. In today's keynote speech, President Christopher Nelson will share his views on citizen participation in Science Museum. Before his inauguration at Association of Science and Technology Center, President Nelson served as the Assistant Director for Open Innovation at White House Office and Science and Technology Policy, where he focused on scaling approach to open innovation such as crowdsourcing, citizen science, and incentive price. He also held an appointment in the Georgetown University Program on Science in the Public Interest. He has actively engaged in various efforts to bring local communities and science closer together. At the Association of Science and Technology Center, President Nelson is committed to sharing various practice and experience to provide science museum leaders and professionals with actionable insight and remind them of the importance of creating both ideas about citizen participation and their role in local community as science hub. So, without any further ado, I'd like to welcome him to the stage with a huge and tremendous round of applause. Please welcome him up to the stage. Thank you, everybody. I'm going to remove, I'm gonna remove this. Thank you. Thank you for that very generous introduction. Thank you to the president and staff of the Science Museum for inviting me. Um, I am absolutely humbled and honored to be among uh, this great set of speakers, um, and I can't wait to hear what everybody else has to say. I'm hoping that I can provide some high-level framing and some uh, initial thoughts on the role of citizen participation in science museums. I'm going to walk around a little bit. Um, I'm going to say some things that some of you won't agree with. I'm going to say some things that I don't even fully agree with, but are going to be intentionally provocative. Because I think we're at a critical time in our field, in the science museum field, science center field, and I think it's really important that we challenge some of our assumptions and that we think differently about the way we do our work. So, let's start with a brief history of everything. 13.8 billion years ago, Big Bang happened. All right, I'm not a cosmologist, um, and we're not going to go back that far, but I do think it's important to position us in history so let's do a brief history of a few things. And I want to clarify what I know, because there's a whole lot of things that I don't know. I know three things, maybe. I know quite a bit about policy. You heard in my introduction that I used to work for the United States federal government doing science and innovation policy. I know quite a bit about open innovation, how you get more people to work on a problem. And I know quite a bit about organizational design and development and how you manage and design effective organizations. And it's that last one that I actually want to spend a couple minutes talking about because I think that the construction of our organizations is a product of the world that we live in. And I think we need to do more to wrestle with how our organizations, science museums, are responding to the rapid changes in the world around us. So, I want to acknowledge that a lot of the story I'm going to tell is going to be Eurocentric. It's going to be based in Europe and North America. And that's a product of the more recent history that I'm going to talk about. But before I do that, I think it's important to acknowledge that humans 
have been discovering things about the world since we emerged as a species. And certainly, science and technology are not a European innovation. If you look around the world, in the 900s, the flowering of mathematics was happening along the Silk Road here in places like Baghdad and Samarkand, places that we have forgotten their names of at this point. So I want to acknowledge that I'm going to fast forward in time and I'm going to talk about a more recent history, but I want to acknowledge that this history is very long and it includes the entire globe. All right, so let's talk about the history of science museums, science centers. John Durant and I were just having this conversation uh, before, uh, during tea, before this session. So I'm not going to go through all of these dates and times, but suffice it to say that if you look at the history, the first sort of natural sciences museums emerge in the 16 and 1700s. But in the middle of the 1800s, you start to see a flowering of science museums, natural science museums. You fast forward to the, the beginning of the 20th century, you start to see museums of science and industry emerge in major centers, again, largely in Europe and North America. And then in the second half of the 20th century, you see the emergence and the absolute explosion of hands-on interactive science centers as we know them today. This is a history that most of you are probably familiar with. I won't go through all of the details, but if you place it on a timeline like this, I think the interesting thing for where we're at today is to actually look at what else was happening in the world. So in the 1800s, you started to see a real explosion in our understanding of the natural world. There was a real organization of the natural sciences, of the medical sciences. That led to major revolutions in medical science, whether it was the discovery of penicillin, whether it was Darwin's origin of species. And it makes sense that these early natural sciences institutions grew up both to be homes of those collections of objects that were leading to those discoveries, but also to be ways for the public to engage in that science and technology. Again, fast forward through the first half of the 20th century, and you see rapid industrialization, rapid mechanization, driven unfortunately and largely by the world wars that were fought in that era, um, but it makes sense that museums of science and industry would come out of a time when science and industry was absolutely exploding on the world stage. And finally, and we're probably all more familiar with this more recent history, in the second half of the 20th century, the space age, the computer age, leading to more hands-on science centers, more science centers, that are dedicated less to collecting objects and researching science and more in STEM learning, science, technology, engineering, and math learning. Um, and so that's where we're at approximately right now. But today's talk is about science and society. It's about citizen participation. So to understand this, we have to go back and we have to overlay what was happening in our broader global society at these moments. In the 1800s, it's no mistake that tied to the exploration and the collection of objects was the expansion of European colonialism. And the, the, um, all of the downsides that come with that. I'm going to say more about that in a little bit, but I'll leave it there. When we get into the 20th century, the first half of the 20th century, hang on, we're going to, we're going to go back and pause on the first half of the 20th century here. Um, we fought a couple of world wars, like I said, and then you started to have 
decolonization after those world wars. You started to have an expansion of democracy. You started to see the importance of museums. Again, the, this is the, flo the flowering of the museums of science and industry dedicated to helping people understand the ways science was impacting their lives, the way science was important to their jobs. Move again ahead, not only do we enter the space age and the computer age, we also enter an age of rapid democratization. The fall of the USSR and expansions of civil rights, expansions of communication technology. I mean, in the last two decades, but the last decade to be sure, the explosion of social media has changed the way we engage with each other as people. It's changed the way our communities engaged. And it's changing our society. And I think the question we have to ask ourselves is how are our institutions changing and what new institutions are being developed to respond to these changes? Okay, that was our brief history lesson. Aren't you glad I didn't start with the Big Bang? So what comes next? Some trends as we look around that we can observe about the world as it exists in 2022. Well, the pace of discovery in science is accelerating. The pace of change in technology is accelerating. We all can't have a conversation without talking about the increasing rates of global climate change and loss of biodiversity. The rapid development of biotechnology spurred in part by the emergence of new diseases. And we're getting more, closer and closer to advanced artificial intelligence, quantum computing, super massive data that allows us to interrogate data in ways that we've never been able to do before. On the society side, increasing global and local migration. The statistics of people who are moving into cities, particularly in this part of the world, are staggering. We are, we are changing the way we live together on this planet. In some ways, that's leading to social divisions. We can also talk about whether or not social media is leading to social divisions, but I think that that's out of the scope of our conversation today. But it's undeniable that we're, we're seeing a world in which there are increasing social divisions. We have new ways of communicating with each other, connecting with each other. That's leading to changes in how we consume information. It's no longer true that I have to go somewhere to get information. It's in my pocket. Well, I left my phone over there. It's over there. But information is, the, the vastness of human knowledge is available to us all the time at our fingertips. We haven't really wrestled with the way that changes the way we engage with the rest of society. And that's leading to changes in pedagogy, changes in education how we learn, what we learn, the structures and systems around education. So I'm sure if I went around the room and asked each of you, you would have a handful of other observations that you would make about the world that we're living in here in 2022. But I think the sum total of these for me adds up to this that we're living in a world where science and technology are intrinsic to every part of human society. That's not a particularly controversial statement. I would imagine in this room that's not at all a controversial statement. Maybe it is. But I want to break this down. I want to do 
sort of a mathematical proof in the form of some words. For those of you who actually know something about math, I'll apologize in advance. But let's take science and technology. Let's agree that science and technology are two sides of the same coin. Technology is the application of science. Science is the discovery that leads to technology. All right, we can take those and we can simplify that part of the equation to simply science. And I want to stipulate that for the rest of this talk, when I'm talking about science, I'm talking about all of it. I'll say more about that, but we'll simplify that. In fact, it's worth understanding really the breadth of what we're talking about here. So let's think about what we mean when we say science in a broad context, in a popular context. There are certainly ways in which science needs to be very tightly defined and disciplines need to define their disciplines. But when we talk about engaging the public with science, when we talk about science learning, we need to talk about it in its broadest context. So let's talk about what we mean. Of course, we mean technology. We already talked about that. Um, I'm waiting for the... There. Technology, of course we mean engineering, mathematics, medicine, but we also mean things like discovery. We mean things like creative thinking, problem solving. In, in short, at least a shorthand that I think works when we talk about this in a big, broad, public sense, is that we're talking about ways of knowing and interacting with the world. That's really what we're meaning, again, in this broad way when we talk about science is intrinsic to every part of human society. All right, let's talk about the second half of this statement. Every part of human society. Well, that's just kind of redundant. You can simplify that to just say human society, and know that we're talking about it broadly. I also think it's important to break down what we mean by intrinsic. That we mean that it's essential to. That it's fundam fundamental. That it's foundational. And I think you can further simplify this to say simply that in 2022, at the end of 2022, science is human society. Now, that may or may not be a particularly controversial statement. Certainly, in forums like this, for a decade or more, we've talked about the role of science in things like the United Nations um, Sustainable Development Goals and the way that science, science museums advance those goals. So this shouldn't be particularly controversial. But I don't think we fully wrestled with what this means, if this is really true. If there is no way to separate science and our human society, then we haven't gone deep enough in really understanding what our role is in that. And that's what I'm going to challenge us to do in the second part of this talk. But I want to take a break and I want to set up a framework here. Um, and, and I want to help uh, you understand sort of the ways in which I'm going to talk about the set of roles that I think we have as science institutions in addressing that problem or addressing that truism that science is human society. All right. So first things first. We need to support lifelong science learning. This is not a controversial statement. This is what probably we all say that we're doing. I think the lifelong part of that is still something that we need to wrestle with. Um, and I know, because I've had other conversations with her and I read her abstract, Genegar later will talk about uh, demographic changes and how their museum is... Uh, is, is serving people later in life, which is super important. That lifelong part is really, really, really important. But that's the first thing we need to do. 
we need to engage diverse audiences. And we've talked about diversity in these forums for years. And we all know that we need to engage diverse audiences. But we're still not as good at it as we should be. We're still not wrestling with all of the ways in which we as institutions are perpetuating some of that colonial history that we came from. We are not fully wrestling with some of the ways that we need to change the way we approach our institutional structures in order to truly engage diverse communities. We need to connect science and society. And this doesn't just mean a superficial connection. This doesn't just mean, oh yeah, we're science and that's society. You see, they're coming through our doors. It means genuine, authentic connections that might actually be more uncomfortable for us than for the rest of society. I'm going to talk more about that. And finally, we need a partner to tackle global and local challenges. And this is the one that particularly as we emerge from the COVID-19 pandemic, as we face increasing climate change and loss of biodiversity, this is the one that we have to increasingly focus on. Because if we're not taking our role in addressing those global challenges, none of the rest of it's gonna matter. We're gonna come back to some stories about how we're doing that. But I wanna set up that framework as we go deeper in thinking about science as human society. Well, if that's true, and I think, again, we can all generally agree that that's true, I wanna challenge us in how we're thinking about human society. Because I think sometimes in these conversations, we think about human society being this big thing. You know, the UN SDGs, this global set of goals, or global climate change, or big things like AI, artificial intelligence, machine learning. What if we switched human society for community? Now, at least for me, this statement is a little more uncomfortable because I'm not sure that science is community. I'm not sure that when you get down to the community level, we can agree, again, if we go back to the original formulation of this statement, that science is intrinsic to every part of community. It is. And I'm going to challenge us to think about that. But I don't, I don't think that this is a true statement. In fact, if we really think about what we mean by community, we're talking about individuals. We're talking about families. Science may, may or may not be a part of every family. Neighbors. Certainly science isn't intrinsic to, to every neighbor relationship. Indigenous nations. Well, okay, indigenous nations are, are dealing with climate change in the same way that all of us are. So maybe, but I'm not sure if it's showing up in day-to-day -day life. Regional planning commissions, well, most regional planning commissions, at least in my country, in my part of the world, are dealing much more with economic development than they are with the environment. But in 2022, if we're not dealing with the environment when we're dealing with economic development, we're missing an opportunity to address our most pressing global challenge. So maybe we need to be. Environmental advocacy organizations are community. Maybe that's science. Faith-based groups, I think a lot of faith-based groups would say no science. Several of them would, but that's a much more complicated relationship. Youth-focused nonprofits, certainly all over the world. There are youth-focused nonprofits focused on STEM and STEAM and learning about new jobs of the future and all of that stuff. But there are plenty of youth-focused groups that are not focused on that. So again, a more complicated relationship. So when we say 
science as community, that sets a little harder. And I would argue that it probably isn't true in its purest formulation. The formulation that I would posit is that science is in relationship to community. That science and community have always been in relationship to one another, but that relationship right now is super apparent. But this, if this is true, this means that we have to think differently about the work that we're doing. And I'm going to talk about specifically what I mean by that. I am going to ask, though, can somebody grab me a bottle of water? Um, if that is at all possible. Um, thank you very much. All right. Sorry. Long plane flight, a lot of talking, uh, need to hydrate. Um, all right. So let's, uh, let's go back. So science is a relationship to community. Okay. Well, now, when we look at that framework, thank you very much. Um, it looks a little bit different, particularly when you come over here to tackling global and local challenges. Because we've all sat in a meeting and said, well, I don't know if we can take that on. I don't know if we're just following the science. That might be too controversial for us to take on a challenge like climate change. 50% of our community doesn't believe in climate change. How are we going to be a part of the solution if we can't tackle the problem? Because the relationship between science and our communities is something that we haven't wrestled with. All right. So let's wrestle with it. Let's wrestle with what it really means to have a relationship between community and science. All right, let's wrestle with what it really means to have a relationship between community and science and what it would look like to strengthen that relationship. Okay. So here's where I'm going to talk a little bit more about my work, my organization, the Association of Science and Technology Centers. We, about five years ago, started to understand that those changing trends that we were seeing, the changing demographics, the changing science and technology, we started to get questions from our members who are science centers and science museums, science engagement organizations all over the world, we started to get questions about, our community is asking us to play a different role. Our community is asking us to do things that we've never had to do before. And we thought, we need to understand this better because there's clearly a change happening here. So we launched what we call our Community Science Initiative. And we spent about two years just trying to understand what we meant by community science. And this is where we really had to humble ourselves because we didn't invent this term. And we certainly, nor were our members, the first types of organizations to really think about science done in service of community priorities or communities that impacted science. So we went and looked at all of that work that was being done all of the ways in which communities and science were in relationship to one another. And we started to define a set of activities, a set of attributes of a deeper relationship between community science and a set of outcomes that we could strive for. And that's what I want to challenge us to wrestle with in terms of what is true if we're strengthening that relationship between community and science. Okay, let me tell a couple of stories because 
That's the fun part of giving a talk. I love to tell stories. So enough theoretical frameworks. Uh, this, is, this is just to say that there are some initial approaches that we identified um, around what things that were helping to strengthen that relationship between communities and science. Things like hosting dialogues and deliberations on important topics around science. Doing community-driven science. I know we're going to have a talk later, and, and I had uh, the, the honor of meeting this morning uh, the gentleman from Citizen Science Asia. We're going to talk a lot about citizen science. There's also community-driven science, which is a little bit different than traditional citizen science. And that was starting to, to be on the rise. Open innovation, the ways in which problems were being solved by communities, not just a group of experts. Civic engagement, policy making, almost every one of these scientific challenges have a policy or civic angle, and of course, participatory research. Okay, time for stories. All right, first story, that is Claudia. Claudia is the Director of Education at the International Museum of Art and Science. The International Museum of Art and Science is in the Rio Grande Valley in the United States of America. The Rio Grande Valley is, the Rio Grande is the river that separates the United States and Mexico. This is in southern Texas, right at the Mexico border. So it's not a wealthy community. It's a community with a lot of migrants. It, and it's a, it's a largely agricultural community. Well, Claudia was working with a group of partners trying to understand sustainable fishing practices in the Rio Grande, and specifically trying to understand the relationship between fishers, who both used that as a source of food, used that as a source of economic uh, income, it was, it was their livelihood, and it was sport. It was economic uh, income because of tourists who came to the river um, to go on fishing expeditions. And yet they were endangering local sea turtle populations. Well, this is a problem that a museum of art and science, like what, what are we going to do about this? There's community groups on both sides of this issue. There are politicians on both sides of this issue. What do we have to add as a museum of art and science to this conversation? Well, what Claudia figured out was that they had a really important role to play because they could be a convener. They could be a trusted source for knowledge about the sea turtle, the ecology that wasn't biased by activism, but also didn't shy away from the harms or the dangers to the sea turtle population. They could also be a source of trust in economic development. The museum has long supported the economy of the local community and could bring those players together. So the museum hosted a number of forums with local political leaders, with scientists, with conservation groups, with local fishing populations, to really understand and talk about ways in which they could manage this issue. So again, on the surface of it, why is the museum involved? Well, the museum's involved, again, going back to that framework of four items, because they saw a connection between science and society, and because this was a local problem, that they were able to leverage their platform to help solve. Aya, Aya Yamamoto. Uh, what is Aya's title? Aya is a public program specialist at the California Academy of Sciences. Um, Aya, as a part of the, the Academy's high level strategy for thriving California was charged with ensuring that indigenous voices were not only heard, 
but have the opportunities to share leadership in that strategy. Have the opportunity to say that, yes, we are the two, almost 200-year-old science institution in the fancy park in San Francisco. But if we're really going to set our mission on a more thriving California, that can't just be through the lens of Western science and technology. That has to include leadership from the indigenous communities who have cared for this land for time immemorial. And so I have set out to build relationships with those indigenous communities. That is a long-term prospect. That doesn't happen overnight. That doesn't fit in the bounds of a nice three-year funded grant that we're going to get and I is going to work on it and then I is going to say, oh, yep, we've done that. Check the box. Let's move on. This is a long-term commitment that this organization is making to ensuring that they're not just science, but also community. One more story along these lines. Kristen. Kristen runs a really unique institution. It's called the Institution um, for Science and Policy at the Denver Museum of Natural History. Now, the Denver Museum of Natural History is the only museum that I know of that has an institute for science and policy. I live in Washington, D.C. There are plenty of institutes of science and policy in Washington, D.C. None of them are at a Museum of Natural History. Kristen is thinking about all of the ways in which she can leverage the science and the, the access that they have to researchers, to scientists, to, to scientific knowledge, to help policymakers in the state of Colorado, where Denver is, make decisions about everything from wild wolf habitats to local conservation issues. Uh, in this particular project, I, I, I wanted to highlight this particular project because I thought it was interesting. She partnered with a local media consortium to help understand and combat misinformation. Now, misinformation is a topic that we all care about deeply. We should all be talking a lot more about misinformation. But as someone who, again, where I sit involved in a lot of national and, and international policy matters, Misinformation oftentimes gets talked about in the context of regulating social media or changing algorithms or something like that. What Kristen and the museum did was say misinformation is a community problem. Misinformation is about whether or not I trust my sources of information, whether or not I trust the person next to me who's telling me something or whether I'm going to go to the internet and trust that more. So again, we can talk about science and society in these really big ways, but when it comes down to it, it's actually science and community. And that is the power of this network of institutions. That is the power that we collectively have, is we can come together in a forum like this and talk about global issues impacting our field. But at the end of the day, it's the local impact that we have that helps change our society. Okay. So let's get back to what that means. What does it really mean to wrestle with that relationship between community and science? Well, like I said, we spent about two years trying to figure that out. We came up with this framework of attributes, that's these, I'm going to talk more about them, and outcomes. Basically, how do, you, how do you think about the work that you're doing to strengthen your relationship between community and science? And these attributes can be applied to anything. They can be applied to a STEM education after school program. They can be applied to an exhibit development. They can be applied to research that you're doing on objects of biodiversity in your natural history museum. So let's 
talk about these for a couple of minutes. First, centering community priorities. So, this is, this is really important, and this goes to the heart of the stories that I just told. It's really important if we're going to wrestle with what it means to be places for citizen engagement, to be places for community, that we really honor and center the priorities of our community, that re we really seek to understand what those are. It's one of the most important attributes of strengthening that relationship. We also have to respect community strengths. This, we've talked about a lot in forums like this, moving from a deficit model of I have the knowledge and I'm going to share the knowledge with you to an asset model. You have knowledge and strengths. I'm going to add your knowledge and strengths to my knowledge and strengths. Really wrestling with what it means to respect community knowledges and strengths in the work that we're doing. Again, from an exhibit we're developing to a program we're running to research we're performing. Sharing leadership. This one's really hard. This one is really hard when you think about what this truly means. And I would challenge us to just get started on it. Figure out small ways of sharing leadership on projects or initiatives, or pieces of exhibits. But there are museums all over the world that are turning over entire galleries to communities, whether it's indigenous nations or communities of color in the United States context, African American or Hispanic communities, and saying, it's our museum, but you get to run the show. That's a really hard thing to do. But that sharing of leadership, again, strengthens that connection. This also is things like ownership. We're going to do a citizen science project. Who owns the data that comes out of that citizen science project? And I'm not putting you on the spot, but I'm saying that that's a question that you have to ask yourself when you start to do deep citizen science. Am I just getting you all to collect some data that I'm then going to go take and publish? Or are we going to own the data and you're going to take and do something different with it than I am? This is hard to do, but it's super important. Being equity focused. Again, we've talked in these forums for many years about the importance of diversity, inclusion, accessibility, equity, but to really wrestle with what it means for everything that we do to have an equity lens, for everything that we do to say that we're going to be intentional about ensuring not just equity of access, but equity of outcomes, which might mean different access for people at the front end in order to ensure equity of outcomes. Again, Advancing equitable outcomes. And all of this is written down, by the way. I see you taking pictures, but um, all of this is written down. And I'm going to give you a website where you can find all of this information once I get through here. All right. Finally, in terms of attributes, it aims for action. And I think this is still one that we're learning how to do as a set of institutions. We're good at sharing knowledge, we're good at communicating. We're good at helping people learn. I don't know that we're good at acting yet. And yet, if you collect the data and you think about the community's priorities, action is often the next step requirement. It's often the thing that you have to do. And it doesn't have to be that the museum or the science center or the science engagement organization is the one acting. 
but is the museum being a platform for others to act? Or are we saying that's not our job? We're just going to stick to the science. Strengthening the relationship between communities and science means acting. Set of outcomes that we're aiming for. I'm going to go through these a lot quicker um, because, again, you can read all of this information, and my goal here isn't to um, go through each of these in detail. Um, but if we're doing this right, we're strengthening community partnerships, we're increasing science agency, we're helping ensure that we aren't, we don't have to be the arbiters of science, that more and more community members can use science to ask and answer questions, that we're ultimately creating more impactful scientific research. If community voices are included in the design of research, and I'm talking all research, I'm talking things from biomedical studies to uh, participatory um, uh, environmental studies. If the community is involved in that from the beginning, the outcomes of the research will go to the benefit of the community more readily. Ethical decision making, this one's probably pretty obvious, but so often um, science is pursued without consideration for the ethics of a community. This is uh, a uh, outcome of involving community more in science. Inspiration for new science. When you have more people, and particularly people from historically marginalized communities asking questions, you're going to come up with new things to explore, new questions that need to be pursued. It's going to increase the capacity for civic engagement, and it's going to increase the capacity for civic engagement in a way that's grounded in science, data, research, and all of those capacities. And we hope, if this is done right, that we're creating sustainable solutions for society. We're creating solutions that are grounded in the community and not parachuted in and said, here is a solution but a solution that is coming from the community. All right. So that is what I came here to challenge you to think about. And that, I hope, helps frame the set of conversations we're going to have over the next two days as we talk about the various ways that citizens are participating in science, the various ways that science museums are advancing the UN SDGs, the ways that citizen science is being leveraged in new and innovative and creative ways. I hope that you keep this relationship in the back of your mind and think about, are we, are we thinking about that on a grand scale? Or are we thinking about that in that relationship between community and science? And are we really wrestling with what attributes need to be present in order for us to do that work? All right. So how do we do more of this? First of all, I promised a website. There's a website, communityscience.astc.org. You can see all of the research behind all of those attributes and outcomes. You can see many examples of projects, including the, the ones that I shared with you. Go there. It's got a lot of information. We also need to be doing more of this. We need to be talking to each other. We need to be challenging each other. We need to be pushing back and saying, that's not going to work for me. And that's okay. But forums like this are really important and one of the reasons why I'm so honored to be here. But ultimately, we need to come home from forums like this and we need to be willing to take risks. We need to be willing to say that sometimes we can't just stick to the science, that we have to aim for action in our communities. And sometimes that's going to fail. We need to be ready to learn from that and grow from it. And finally, like I said before, the power of convenings like this is that collectively we represent a lot of institutions with deep connections to a lot of communities, impacting hundreds of millions of people around the world. And so 
We need to be working together to take action and aim for those sustainable solutions for our society. All right, I'm running out of time. These are, our, are, are the four things that if we're doing these with that community science at the core, we're going to ensure that all people can participate in science and technology. We're going to engage diverse communities so that the full diversity of people and communities are equal participants in science and technology. We know that historically that hasn't been true. That was the whole purpose of that timeline. If we're engaging increasingly diverse communities, we can ensure that that changes. We're connecting science and society to enable diverse communities to contribute to science and techn technology. There's so much untapped potential out there that we could be benefiting from as a society. And finally, we're going to partner to tackle global and local challenges so that all of humanity, now we've gone from community back to humanity, benefits from that science and technology. And it's not as unequally distributed as it currently is. All right, one last very quick story. And this is one that I challenge you to think about. So David, David works for the Science Museum in Minnesota. David's a relatively junior staff member at the Science Museum in Minnesota. David um, was approached by a community group that he had done a lot of education work with around um, a local uh, land, uh, an old um, uh, juvenile detention facility that had been closed. And um, the group that he was working with really wanted to have a voice in developing that land. Politicians, obviously, also had ideas about how to develop that land, as did local environmental groups. David said, much like um, our first story in the Rio Grande Valley, David said, well, we're a museum. We don't really know about land use, but we can be a trusted forum to bring all of these people together. So he started planning a facilitated forum to talk about all these issues, to bring scientists who could talk about the environmental issue, to bring education leaders who could talk about the potential for education, all of these things. Great. Well, as he was planning that, a member of the city council called him, again, junior staff member at a science museum, called him and said, you have to stop this. You're getting in my way. I have plans for that land. David was scared, and he should have been. That's a really threatening thing for a city council member to do. David called us because we were actually supporting him in this project at ASTC, and he said, oh my God, do I stop? What do I do? We said, you need to tell your museum leadership. You need to, you need, you know, they know what you're doing, but you need to tell them, you need to work with them. So he ends up in a meeting with his vice president of government affairs at his museum, hit the president of his museum, um, and a couple other senior staff. And they said, don't stop. Keep going. We don't care that maybe we're going to ruffle some feathers. As long as we're sticking to our values, as long as we're bringing the community together in an authentic way that aligns with our values, then we're doing our job. So it takes courage sometimes. But if we do this, we change our relationships with our communities, and we change communities' relationships to science. Thank you. All right, thank you, President Nelson, for your tremendous and great keynote speech. Okay, so it seems that you're ready to start the Q&A session. I am. Yeah, but you, you should drink water first. Think, well, why don't we take the first question and I'll have a drink of water. All right, thank you. All right, and shall we move on to the Q&A session? And also, uh, we collect some pre-questions on the webpage for ISSM 2022. So please show up the question on the screen. Okay. 네, 한국어로 질문을 읽어 드립니다. So the first question is, so you've been involved in many activities in the US to promote 
community-centered science museum. So what kind of efforts should governments and science museums around the world make? That, this is a really good question in terms of the efforts that uh, governments and science museums should make. And I think, I think that there's a lot more opportunities for partnerships between governments and science museums beyond the partnerships that already exist. A lot of the partnerships that currently exist revolve around uh, education. They revolve around research. Um, but they don't revolve around problem solving. They don't revolve around uh, addressing uh, those community needs. I think there could be a lot more opportunities for that. Let me just give you one very quick example. That example is in the United States, uh, the National Oceanographic and Atmospheric Administration, NOAA, the uh, agency in the US federal government that is charged with understanding in large parts the impacts of climate change on uh, our atmosphere. They have partnered with dozens of museums around the country to map urban heat islands. So the museums have partnered with their communities to go off and use cheap technology to map where there are heat islands. And in understanding that, those communities are getting a better understanding of how the changing climate in their local region is impacting the people who live there. But NOAA, the government agency, is getting a national view of that in a way that goes much deeper than their satellites do because they're getting on the ground data. So there's an example of how a government and a set of museums can partner on something that is really doing science in service of solving a global challenge. All right, thank you for your generous and detailed answer for that question. Thank you. And shall we move on to the next question? On the screen. <laughs> Let me ask a question. Uh, as we saw in the abstract, uh, citizen participation is very important. And there are large science museum and small science museum. And I believe their approach should be different. So what kind of difference should we have? And there are so many science museums under ASTC in large and small scale. So. If there is any representative example of citizen partner, uh, participation, please explain us. Uh, this is a great question. And yes, of course, there are differences between what large museums do and what small museums do. I actually, what I have observed is that smaller museums actually are further along in terms of citizen participation than larger museums are. I don't, I haven't really understood why that is, but I think it's because they're closer to their communities. They're, they're more connected with their communities. And so there's more opportunities for citizen participation in the everyday work of the museum. Let me give you one pretty famous example of a small museum in the Adirondack Mountains in rural New York state. They're just about, uh, 150 kilometers from Canada. Um, small Natural Sciences Museum, um, the Wild Center. They have for over a decade run a youth climate summit that every year brings youth together during the winter months actually when the museum is closed to talk about, to dialogue around, to find solutions to climate. And, and that's that is an example of a small museum taking that on because they recognized a need in their community because they were so close to their community. I actually think it's harder for a large science museum in a larger urban area to take on that part, that type of grassroots citizen participation. You have to be more intentional about it because it's easier to, um, to not ignore it, but it, you're less, it's less in your face every day than it is as a small museum that sees those people and interacts with them more often. 
All right. Thank you so much. You were great and detailed answer for that question. And then next, I'd like to give our participants on site to give him and share your any opinion or a question or suggestion in this keynote speech session. So if you have any question, all right. Please hand over the mic to him, the front line. Thank you. Well, uh, Mr. I just forgot your name. Anyway, no. thank you very much for your comprehensive and perspective uh, keynote speech. Uh, my name is Hyung Sik Shin. I am the president of uh, Korea Basic Science Research Institute. Uh, my question may not be uh, out of the scope of this, top, uh, this topic, but you know, people say uh, we are in living in so-called fourth industrial revolution age. You may, you may not agree to that. But anyway, uh, these days, uh, I, I believe there are two, uh, in a way, conflicting paradigms are prevailing in uh, science and technology society. One is, one is that um, uh, so-called uh, techno, uh, technopolitics age uh, group, uh, st uh, state with a better technology, or you know, the better technology uh, wins the game and takes all the benefit. So-called uh, winner takes all. It's a technology uh, um, uh, but, um, anyway. Te technology is very important, and we have to compete for the uh, for the better technology. And the uh, uh, the other side is. You know, we are uh, at, at, uh, after the advent of COVID-19 pandemic, uh, we, uh, uh, we developed the vaccine in, uh, in a year. Usually it takes like more than 10 years, but we, uh, amazingly, we developed the vaccine and medicine in a year. That's based on the so-called open science. You know, the, the research groups in all over the world uh, you know, reveal their data, data and technology. Uh, for that sense, uh, to the, uh, to, uh, for, the, uh, for this uh, for, uh, for this sense, so-called uh, cooperation between the states, between research groups, are very important. So my question is, you know, uh, as an uh, uh, old scientist, how to teach the uh, young scientist? Uh, you know, teach with the in the competition or co cooperate uh, with the research colleagues all over the world? Uh, you, um, that is a little outside of the scope of what I talked about, but very much within my area of policy expertise, particularly when it comes to open science. Um, and I have, an, and I agree with you that I do think that those two paradigms exist. There is the, the winner takes all, we have to be first to develop quantum computing or artificial intelligence or whatever. And then there is the open science, if everybody has access to the data, we can learn faster, we can collaborate better. I, I lean very much on the side when you're talking to young scientists, when you're talking to uh, people coming up in research of leaning toward open science and focusing on the benefits of collaboration, whether that's collaboration within your lab, collaboration within your field or scientific domain, or collaboration within a, a global scientific framework that enables other people in other domains to have input. And, I, and the reason why I say that is that there are economic and geopolitical interests that will push us toward the closed competitive version of science. But if we start by teaching young scientists how to collaborate, that's a skill they will be able to use no matter where they go, even if they find themselves in a more closed competitive field. It is much harder to teach someone to collaborate if they start out in a framework of closed competitiveness. 
So I don't know if that fully answers your question, but that's my opinion. All right, thank you so much. That's wonderful. Thanks to your great question and answer, it can be a very great opportunity to broaden our perspective on these issues. And then next, actually we have uh, plenty, uh, some little more time to, yeah, all right. <laughs> um, how, how I can, yeah. Would you please hand over the mic to the front line with yellow scarf? Yeah, you. <laughs> uh, Chris, my, my question is really short. Um, this change that you are framing in, in science centers um, needs a different capacity in the team of, of a science center because we are used to design exhibitions and do workshops and these kind of traditional things. How do you think we should work on capacity development in the in the entire field and how do you think we can collaborate on, on that that's a great question secret um the it does require different capacities uh and, and and i would actually point you to that website because there's some of that information there but just to to name three really quickly it requires listening in a way that exhibit development did really require community listening or community uh, organizing. That's, that's a capacity that, that is, is new. And, and we're starting to see science museums hire community organizers from you know, the political world, from the environmental world, to work in the museum because they're good at listening to their community. So it requires listening, requires facilitation skills, if you're going to be a trusted platform to bring people together, you have to do a good job of facilitating that conversation. Otherwise, you're going to lose that trust. Listening, facilitation, and it requires collaboration. Back to this question. I'll, I'll bring it back to this question. Which really authentic collaboration, again, collaboration that takes those attributes into account, that shares leadership, that re respects strengths. All, that is a really hard thing to do. And it requires a skill set. It can be taught, but that's a skill set that isn't often found in the current set of staff at Science Museum. Yeah, they, they know how to collaborate on their team, and the exhibit designers know how to collaborate with the exhibit fabricators and things like that. But really open collaboration, even across the institution, is harder to come by. So listening, facilitation, collaboration, those are all a set of skills that are going to be required in order to do this. Um, there, there are a number of ways that ASTC, and I, I assume that you're setting me up to answer this question in this way, um, so I'm gonna take my liberties here, is working as a network to help share ideas across museums about what those skill sets look like in practice so that you can take learnings from a museum that's already hired a community organizer and apply that to your museum. There, there are ways that we're setting up specific capacity building to grow the skills. In fact, the four stories that I shared today all of those four people were a part of a year-long fellowship program that we, ASTC, ran to give them the partnership, the partnership collaboration skills, the listening skills, the facilitation skills to run those types of programs. So we're working directly in museums across the world to develop those skills. So this is something that we need to talk a lot more about and we need to continue to build, but I appreciate you recognizing it and I look forward to working with all of you to continue building that. All right, thank you. It was a perfect answer for your question. And next, this is the last one question. Um, thank you very much. And I just uh, want to hear a little bit more about what you mentioned on open innovation and maybe uh, a little bit more on how technology can help uh, with the collaboration, you know, um, that you mentioned. Thank you. Yeah. Absolutely, Yanagar. I'm, I'm, uh, again, I appreciate, um, like the gentleman over here, um, bringing in some of my policy background in open innovation. Let me just very quickly, when I talk about open innovation, I talk, I, I, I'm using open innovation as, as 
opposed to closed innovation. So closed innovation is we're going to get a group of people in a room and we're going to solve this problem, right? The, the four of us, we're going to go get in a room, we're going to go solve the problem. Open innovation is here's the definition of the problem. We're going to put it up on the screen here and whoever in the room can solve the problem, that's, that's the solution we're going with. So that's open innovation as opposed to closed innovation. And you asked specifically about how technology can enable that. Well, technology is enabling that in all sorts of different ways. There's probably um, three. First of all, just communication technology, which enables us to reach and engage deeply with people who cannot physically get together. So when you're talking about posing a problem for the world to solve, you can now, even from Bangkok or Daejeon or Washington, D.C., get a truly global audience to help you solve that problem because of communications technology, because you can make the data available, because you can hold online meetings, because you can do all of those things. The, the second part is the, the expanding democratization of access to data and data processing technology. When more and more people have access to advanced artificial intelligence that is easy for lay pe people to use, you can interrogate data in new ways. And so you can get people who have a domain expertise over here to answer a question over there. Really quick story about this. Um, uh, and this was this is 10 years old now. I was working in the federal government and I was working with NASA, the National Air and Space uh, Air, Aeronautics and Space Administration. You all know what NASA is. Um, uh, and my job was to convince NASA that other people could solve their problems. And as you can imagine, and we have some space people in the room, um, their response initially was, well, we're literally rocket scientists, so nobody else can do this. Um, right initial answer, but we said, trust us, what's a hard problem that you have that you haven't been able to solve or would cost you a lot of money to solve? And they said, actually, we're having this problem with solar flares. Solar flares affect everything from astronauts in orbit to telecommunications here on Earth. And we have a bunch of data on sun activity, but we have really bad algorithms for predicting solar flares. Okay, well, is there anything secret about that data? No, it's not secret at all. Okay, can you make that data available and say, anyone who can give us a better algorithm to predict solar flares gets an amount of money. It was $50,000, which is not that much money. You know who came up with an algorithm that was three times better than the in-house algorithm that NASA had developed? A 65-year-old semi-retired radio engineer from the state of Vermont. So he'd been thinking about solar flares and telecommunications for his whole life. But once he had access to the data, and once he was asked to solve the problem, he spent a few months on it and he solved the problem. So technology can enable you to really frame a question and get the whole world to work on giving you the answer. So that's a little bit longer of an answer, but a really important way in which we can't be precious. I tell that story also to remind my science museum colleagues that yes, there are special knowledge that we have about how to engage visitors and build exhibits and all of those things, but you'd be surprised what your community knows. You'd be surprised at the ways that they can help you solve problems. You just have to ask them and give them the ability to give you an answer you can use. And technology is critical to that. All right, it's perfect. So due to the time constraint, sadly we need to conclude this keynote speech session with this. So thank you very much for your sincere support and dedication. Please give him a huge and tremendous round of applause. It was President Nelson for this keynote speech session.